The first game in the losers round 3 for the world championship, this time between DJ Premier from UK against C Knight from USA is all about to begin. Goblins against Isengard on the beautiful map Etan Morris Edit boys. It's the best of 5 and the winner of this best of 5 series will be facing against Sauron in the losers round 4. Let's get it started. Goblins against Isengard. Okay, so Etan Mars Edit is not the biggest map in the world, and also Jungles of Faharat got banned, which is the Goblin map. You know, for sure, actually. <laughs> uh, but I don't know about Goblins against Isengard on this map, but we shall see. We have the purple Goblin player DJ Premier from UK against the blue Isengard player C Knight from USA, the American player from the Boys Clan. Uh, powerpoint wise, Goblin player might start with the Cave Bats, also Warchan and uh, Isengard actually gonna pick the Creepy in already. Starting with two Furnaces, I'm assuming he's gonna go for the Work Pit. Um, and yeah, that's gonna be the case, because the system, this is very viable, because the Work Packs, as we know, they have the, they have the whole ability, which is replacing the Warchant. So you have a buff in their kit, and the debuff from your Powerpoint menu. It's a win-win situation. You make your units stronger anyway, and as all ability can't stack with the war chant, uh, you are make, you are buffing your own units and debuffing the enemy units on top of that. And I think work packs in general in this matchup early on against uh, goblins they should be doing fine. They are also quite mobile as we know. And yeah, let's see. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's gonna make a transition immediately. We have also seen a couple of times Isengard uh, starting with the clan setting against goblins because clan sitting now costs less than in the version 8.3 and with that being said actually we have seen clan sitting a couple of times against goblins and it was working out almost every time because those wildmen of Dunland they are able to win the 1v1 skirmishes against the goblin warriors and they are slightly more expensive but i would say in many situations they are also more useful Okay, so we're gonna have the Goblin Warriors on the field. Let's see now if the work pack's gonna defend. Nope, that's not gonna be the case. They won't be able to see the Goblin Warriors. Goblin player DJ Premier didn't pick any power point ability just yet. Uh, I think he's looking for potential tunnels here around the top right side. I don't know why he was using the whole ability. Yeah, he's gonna go for the creep. Ah, that's nice looting away. Nice bursting, actually. And dealing a lot of damage. Very well creeped here. I mean, he got damaged a little bit, but it's not a big deal because he's gonna hit level 2 after getting the White Slayer. And then he might also capture this in. I feel like in in this matchup for Isengard can be a great choice because um, you are able to make the block Black Orcs. They are uh, way cheaper than Urukai, and they should be doing just fine against the Goblin Spam. Okay, Clan Sitting is coming up now, and actually, when you think about it, now he has Work Pit for, uh, you know, Work Packs and Work Riders. He's going for the Wildman. And from here, he can make those melee strong tanky units like Black Oryx. He has potentially three barracks under his control. I think C I think C Knight was I think C Knight was losing the treasure. <laughs> yeah, he lost the treasure. I was not paying attention, but he was not happy. He was typing lol in the chat. And also, the Goblin Warriors were actually almost able to take down those uh, work packs here, which is kind of interesting in a one v one situation. Even though those work packs from C Knight were not using the whole ability for some reason. On the bright side for the goblin player, he has now four goblin caves under his control. It's gonna be a goblin spam like crazy. <clears throat> but they will be forced to play against uh, Warc Riders now and also the Wildsman of Dunland. And the Isengard's player didn't capture this one just yet. It looks like he's doing the same thing with the work packs on the other side of the map and he's gonna get the second and the last White Slayer now under his control. Pretty nice. And a lot of goblins from DJ Premier are moving forward. Warchan is still available for DJ and Krivian is still available for C Knight. Warchan is gonna be used now and the Warc Riders, they need to be careful against clumped units. You don't wanna trample in between because you're gonna get slowed down. We have seen this scenario a couple of times already. It's nothing you wanna do because you're gonna actually punish yourself with that move. But if you have multiple of these units on the field like he does now with two battalions and whole and on top of that debuffing the enemy units, that might be enough to one-shot the entire army. Let's see. He's diving in now, but he's getting still slowed down, but he's not receiving any damage now because this follow-up is coming now with the 2nd Battalion. They're gonna trample once again. 
And that's a nice cleanup here, by the way, from Xenite. He's doing a great job with the work packs, also spotting the work riders, and they were able to get away without. I mean, the second battalion is kind of undamaged at all. The first one should be perfectly fine as well. Pandango, thank you so much for the follow and welcome. We fight. During, during all this time, we have. Um, yeah, Spider Pit coming up now. Spider Pit is a great choice against work packs and also against the work riders. Those spider links are quite mobile. And just like the Elven units from the Elven faction, they are also able to get stealthed around the trees. And DJ was not able to deal any kind of economical damage just yet to the Isengard's player, which is bad, because Isengard has a crazy eco scaling into the mid to late game. Isengard, a faction which has industry, devastation, fuel the fires, you know, a very strong eco, definitely in the late game, and he, it, will, it will help C Knights now. The fact that he was keeping all the furnaces alive to reach that milestone of having a great eco of being able to spam units all the time. And we need to also keep in mind that Isengard units in overall in those 1v1 uh, skirmish situations are stronger than the goblin units. Okay, this time we had the war chant from C Knight. Uh, he has more power points collected than his opponent, way more power points collected than his opponent actually. DJ Premier has now 3 power points collected after the Warchant, and C Knight has 1 after Warchant and Kribin. 450 command points available for C Knight, 500 command points available for DJ Premier. He has 4 Goblin Caves and a Spider Pits level 1. But he keeps losing those fights and the Goblin Spam is actually being kinda denied quite nicely from the American player C Knight. He knows how to deal with the goblins and he was also able to keep all his furnaces. Yes, you heard it right. He didn't lose a single furnace so far in, into the game. And C Knight is one of those Isengard players who likes to make the transition into the Lumber Mills much, much faster. Because when we ever see other players playing Isengard faction, they like to wait until late game. And some of them are only making Lumber Mills when they have enough power points collected for Field of Fires. But C Knight is making those Lumber Mills way, way faster and way, way earlier. Okay, this fight is looking actually good for now. He will be able to kill those Wildman of Dunland, but you know, Isengard's player is gonna lose now the first furnace in, into the inside the uh, front line of the base and uh, in the game number one. The Warc Riders, they need to be careful, they are taking a lot of damage and that's a mistake from C Knight, he's gonna lose the entire battalion here unfortunately. The thing is, the tricky thing is about this part, that you need to kill so many goblins in order to get the power points like you're giving to your opponent by losing only one Warcrider Battalion. Because goblin warriors, they are really cheap and killing them does barely give you any experience and any power points. While losing your Warcriders is gonna give your opponent a bunch of power points. They're gonna be able to take down another furnace here which is really good and important during all this time, the work. Packs were trying to take down this uh, tunnel here in the backside, but they won't be able to. We have some small fights going on also between Wildmen. One of them is even level 3. They should be able to win the 1v1 situations, but there will not be a 1v1 situation in this, in this case. Because he has 4 Goblin Caves under his control. No hero transition just being you know made so far. Uh, spider Pit is only level 1. We might see some Spider Riders later on, hopefully, potentially. Spider Lynx are fighting against work packs, uh, work riders I mean. One of the Lumber Mills is being taken down. Power point wise, now Goblin Play has collected 5 power points after Cave Pets and War Chant. And C Knight has still the advantage. He has 8 power points collected almost after War Chant and Kribin. 525 command points against 575. So it's even in almost any case, while the Goblin Play is slightly ahead in terms of, um, in, in terms of command points. Isengard's player is slightly ahead in terms of power points. And uh, that's a lot of investment for those Wildman of Dunland units. You know, when you purchase the torches for 200 resources. And if you lose them, you are losing 350 resources for a unit. Still actually cheaper even with the upgrade of torches than Urukai. This is under control from C Knight. This is not being captured just yet from either the Goblin player but also from the Isengard player. So we're gonna get some Black Orcs on the fields now from the inn. A small fight in the middle of the map. But more reinforcements are coming all the time. He has four Goblin Caves all the time, like from the beginning of the game almost. 
and he keeps spamming goblin even though the goblin spam in this case was not very successful early on but later on he was still able to take down some of those furnaces this one in the front is almost down as well it's actually very close to get destroyed uh, I'm assuming oh we're gonna have spider allies summon okay it's gonna be definitely taken down now and C Knight has to make sure to keep at least the ones in the backside alive because the one in the backside is also being damaged. And we know those spiders, they are hitting like a truck against those uh, resource buildings, especially when they are not level 3. They're gonna focus down this one first, I'm assuming. Uh, thank you so much for the follow and welcome to the stream. Hope you're gonna enjoy your stay. Okay, the furnace is getting bursted down. And Goblin player is now being able to push Isengard back big time. He's gonna commit now on the furnace level 2 in the backside. And the Vork Riders are now falling apart, but we have now Sharku on the field. And Sharku, a hero who was very uh, effective against the Elven faction in the World Championships game so far. And he's a great hero overall. A really cost-efficient hero. He gives spot to the Vork Riders. He gives spot to the Vork Packs. He has a lot of splash damage. Very great against clumped armies. Also in this case against the Goblins. Tangilon, thank you so much for the follow and welcome. Okay, the inn is getting destroyed actually from the goblin player, which is smart. He doesn't want to face against the black orcs. And he doesn't want to be too much worried about this side. That's an interesting goblin playstyle definitely, because he has zero tunnels close to the side of Isengard's player. Normally the, the goblin players are trying to get those tunnels closer to the side of Isengard. But that's not being the case. Also we need to give credits to Sinite, who was doing a great job actually defending himself early on. But later on, there are just too many goblins to deal with. And Isengard's eco after losing those furnaces. You know, Isengard has a really strong eco, but there is a reason for that. Because Isengard is also one of the most expensive units in the game. Clan setting is uh, level 1 only, actually. So no extra verse any soon. And he never made the transition into the Uruk pit. So he's fully committing to Waldman of Dunland and Warc Riders exclusively. No crossbowmen all game long, which is a mistake, because spiderlings are very weak against crossbowmen. But they should they should be doing just fine against Warc Riders and against Wildman of Dunland. And you need to kinda stop them and have some defensive units around your own side. Crossbowmen in, in this matchup are very effective in my opinion. Okay, or, or extroverse transition might be very necessary as well. Charku is gonna dive in. He's level 3 already, has the leadership unlocked for the Warc Riders. The splash is gonna come in clutch now. But he, he's also taking a lot of damage actually from the poison blades. We will have tainted land now from the goblin player. Isengard went for the devastation and was using it already. Has 9 power points collected. In the worst case he can always cover this tainted land with his own. Which is, you know, gonna be possible now after one more power point. The furnace here is getting attacked. We have also half throw swordsman on the field. A great counter to the war riders, definitely. They can't get trampled down, we know that. The furnace is gonna go definitely down. Isengard's player has, I mean, he should still have some somewhat great resources with the lumber mills and with this level three furnace in the backside, level two furnace in the uh, at the corner at the top side. But the problem is, he also has to spam units all the time. He's gonna go for the Wildman of Dunland summon, which in this case can be useful, and he's gonna use it offensively. You wanna deal as much damage as possible to the economy of the goblin player, and if DG doesn't pay attention. He will not only lose his tunnels, but uh, with the pillage ability of those Wildman units, he will also give a lot of free, free resources to Sinite. Charku is healing up over time. Uh, one tunnel has been taken down and, you know, there is no follow-up and there are just too many goblins to deal with. He was fully committing to, the, to actually take down only one tunnel. He was using Wildman of Dunland and his Warchant buff. And even his Kribean is being used for this attack. Okay, again Sharku can't also trample them, but Sharku can obviously basic attack them and dealing a lot of damage even to half throw swordsman. He's level 4 now. Will they be able to take down the level almost 3 furnace? It's almost level 3. Level 3 can save it? No, it's not gonna be able to save. And the level 3 has been taken down. And that's why Isengard now is sitting only on 350 command points. While the goblin player has 850 command points without any battle expansions around the fortress. So I don't even know what actually went wrong in this game number one for Sinite because he was so ahead early on. He was defending himself quite nicely 
defended the first three four big pushes from the goblin player without losing anything but i think the macro play because the goblin player was expanding very nicely at the bottom side keeping his eco alive being able to make four production buildings in you know goblin caves and spam all the time the goblins and again you know goblins are very cost efficient so even if you go toe to toe with isengard in those skirmishes it's gonna favor you in the mid to late game because you lose a hundred resource costing units and damaging a unit from a level two barracks i mean production building which costs 500 resources this is a trade you wanna you are taking all day long you know what i'm saying nice commitment the work pet level 2 has been taken down the furnace level 3 is the only thing remaining actually from isengard that's the only resource building he has left on the field and what a great performance here from dg premier in the game number one gg is being called and the first game is going to uk it's coming home maybe for uk once again this time for the world championship for rise of the witch king the game number two, this time on the map Westfold Edit, boys. Uh, between Elves against Isengard, good against evil El Clasico. DJ has the upper hand in the first after the first game on the map Etanmore's Edit. Let's see if he can extend his lead and potentially be able to win even 3-0 against C Knight. But C Knight is a strong Isengard player, and the first game is always a warm-up game. It's a limit testing game in my opinion and after the first game you can still shine bright like a diamond we're gonna see if this is gonna be the case for the american player c knight with the blue isengard against the purple elven player dj premier who was having a great performance with the goblin faction in the first game else against isengard hmm i feel like in this matchup C Knight has to get Sharko on the field. I know it sounds kind of rude to say that, but I feel like Sharko is the way to go. Because Sharko is pretty effective against everything from the Elven faction besides Pikeman. And even if the Elven player DJ Premier is gonna make some Lancers, it's still a great, you know, great unit to counter with Sharko. And Sharko against Clumped Archers? Holy moly, guys. We have seen him already devastating an entire Archer army only by himself. Quite cost efficient hero, mobile, dealing tons of damage. I feel like Sharku is the way to go. We will actually have three furnaces into the Uruk pit this time. And no work pit or no clan seeding start against elves. And the elven player is building two Malone trees, barracks into the third Malone tree. And actually starting with those Lorian warriors. So pretty normal start from both the players in the game number two. And no early barracks this time for elves because we have seen this already a couple of times from Imperialist. That he's gonna go for a for a early barracks for early harassment, which is something you don't expect from the Elven faction. And making uh, those unpredict unpredictable moves is actually a great uh, blind counter thing to any uh, to the enemy faction. Okay, we will have Urukai start into the crossbow man, so no one is going for creeps actually. They're gonna go for harassment, but the problem is the second battalion of the Elven player DJ Premier are gonna be those Lorian archers and. Uh, they should be out by the time, and especially because the Urukai are leading kind of forward into, into the barracks. So they will run into the archers here, which is not going to be the same case for the Alvin player, because he's running downwards. The furnace, he might go into the backside of the furnace, and even if the crossbowmen are going to be out in time, I think they won't be able to protect this furnace here. Okay, Urukai are just losing a lot of time, they're going to go. They're gonna move now through this bottom side. But you can already see yourself, the Vlorian warriors reach the other side of the map way, way faster than the Urukai. And that's what I talk was talking about. He was forced to demolish the furnace immediately. This one has to be protected, by the way. But the Elven player DG Premier might also use his rallying call for that. It looks like he doesn't want to you know, risk the biscuit. We're gonna have another battalion of crossbowmen actually from Isengard. In the Urukai, they were not able to deal any kind of to deal any kind of economical damage just yet. But archers and pikemen are moving forward. They might take down the creep in the middle of the map, by the way, which is a possibility and a great choice for the Elven faction. Okay, he was kind of unlucky now moving forward. Now he is forced to retreat. The small on three is definitely gonna be taken down. And C Knight was, I mean, uh, DJ Premier was even able to kill some of those crossbow men. He's gonna go down now, there is no way he will be able to deal any more damage. 
And the buff is still available for both the players. I'm actually curious if C Knight is gonna use his War Chant buff now on the Urukai. If he should be doing it, you know, if he yeah, if yes, he should what, what do, you, do you see that? How they, how hard they are getting body blocked. What what the heck was that actually? <laughs> they move stop, they move stop, they move stop. Nice defense here from DG Premier, definitely. Losing absolutely nothing. Not a single pikeman has been taken down. And both players are being very patient with their buffs. So Rallying Call is still available, but also Warchant is still available. Get a gifted sub. Alright, I'm gonna gift you a sub after this game, Abdo. You have collected 35,000 points already. That's pretty nice. Okay, the Warg Pit is gonna be taken down. The Warg Lair, I mean. Stable is up on the field and the first Lancer is already here. One power point collected after the Rallying Call and one power, one, you know... 400 command points uh, collected, 2 power points collected, and 450 command points available for C Knight. But there are no pikemen on the field, are they? No, that's gonna be devastating, boys. Holy moly. Oh, he needs to be very careful. He needs to give up this furnace. He needs to make the transition immediately into some pikemen. Okay, he has one pikeman on the field. As he was able to creep the work layer. Um, but he has only one pikeman for 3 battalions of crossbowmen and 1 urukai. I think that's not gonna be enough. He has also the cave pads upgrades now on the fortress and a work pits level 2. Okay, so uh, no transition just yet into Sharku. I would like to see Sharku before the transition into work riders. Because you can easily get some experience and get him potentially even level 7. Okay, we have the first big fight in the middle of the map. Oh, be careful here. Nice trample, a nice micro here from DG Premier definitely. Taking down some of those units. And, you know, in this, at this point, it's also very important to actually force your opponent to micro. What I'm trying to say with that is, he sees the enemy Lancers coming, he needs to reposition his army, and during this time, he's not able to shoot. And DJ Premier keeps shooting all the time with his archers. And he was actually being able to take down the pikemen, but that's not gonna be also Fiesta now. Warg Riders are coming in clutch, trampling down those Lorian archers. And the fight, after all, was kinda even. So the only, only the cavalry units will be able to survive that and some Urukai and, and archers. One of them is level 2.5, so he should be recovering over time. They have also pikemen now on the field from DJ Premier. The stable is level 1 and the barracks is also still level 1. Power point wise, after the first big fight, we have 5.5 power points collected from DJ. 500 command points. 450 command points from C Knight. And he has also collected 5 power points, which was invested for the Kribin. This furnace is gonna be definitely taken down. He needs to make sure to make more and more pikemen all the time. No heroes on the field just yet. And there are still so many creeps left on the map Westfold, and maybe Isengard's player should be trying to creep these with the Warg Riders. They're quite mobile, and those Warg Riders they should also be used for harassment. Because after the first attack of the Urukai, in which he was able to take down this Malon tree here, he wasn't able to take down any other anything else. From DJ and DJ is being in a good situation right now. Uh, Isengard's player seems to be much more defensive. He is actually waiting to get attacked, and DJ Premier is the one who is actually having the upper hand, who is the one who keeps the pressure all the time. Um, and C Knight has to actually break that uh, break that current situation because only defending is not gonna make you win. You need to also do some damage. On the other side of the map. We have also Haldir now on the field against no heroes from Isengard just yet. Haldir can be a great hero later on. Haldir is a hero, I feel like, is a very impactful and strong hero of the Elven faction. One of the heroes we see on almost every single game. Like, elves have, you know, two heroes to go. Haldir and Glorfindel. We barely see any other heroes. Like Eldron, for example, because of the price, is very expensive, obviously, but the heroes we are always able to see from the Alban faction are definitely Haldir and Glorfindel. 550 command points collected now for Isengard. Yes, the Warg Riders. I can't see where they are. They are actually at the top side. He's gonna creep the Warg Lair with them, two battalions of them. One power point collected after the Warchen and Kribane. Alban player has now a bunch of units on the field. The transition into the stable level 2 or barracks level 2. Has not been made just yet, but we might see later on some midfoots. 
And TJP has collected 7 power points after the rallying call he is trying to save for the end shrouding mist. Double Uruk pits now and a Vork pits level 2. He's gonna build a Ballista expansion for defensive purposes and rallying call has been used offensively from DJ. On the other side we have also Vorchan being used for defense. And the Vork riders are coming from the backside but they need to avoid. There are two battalions of pikemen and in this situation maybe just kill the archers because there is only one archer battalion. You don't need to trample. Aldir has to be very careful in this situation, by the way, he's taking way too much damage. He's also dealing a lot of damage in return, actually. He's gonna go for the mist. I hope he's not gonna use it here. He's gonna use it here anyway. I don't know about that. Like, there is nothing to... that nothing left anymore. Ooh, that's a mistake from DJ. He's running into the pike, man. Oh, no. Aldir will be taken down as well for the fiesta. It was looking so good for him. He should just retreat. That was a win, 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 win situation for C9 definitely. What a big throw from, from DJ there. A very questionable usage of the mist. No archers remaining on the field anymore. And he actually doesn't see the pikemen and running straight into them. And losing Haldir right after. That was the worst possible outcome of the fight for the Elven player. Holy moly, guys. I don't know about that. I mean, C Knight now has the, has the chance, but the Elven player is still definitely ahead. He has 725 command points collected, you know, against 500. But that was giving uh, C Knight a lot of power points, so he is now only two power points away from getting the um, Devastation. I think Devastation is the way to go, definitely. And he needs to get some heroes on the field as well. He needs Lords and he needs also Sharko. I think Lourdes is one of the best anti-hero anti -hero heroes in the game because, you know, if this Glorfinn is gonna be a problem later on, you can just cripple him down with level 4 and then you are safe. You have leadership with Lourdes, you have Carnage, you have so much for a low price. And he needs also Sharko. I think he's saving. Nah, never mind. He's not saving anything. He actually keeps spamming units all the time. Double Barracks against, on, against also Double Barracks, okay? We have also Double Barracks now for the Elven player. Glorfindel is only level 1. We have Lancers, Archers and Pikemen on the field. Isengard has the same units. But the Lancers here from uh, DJ, they have to be careful. The Malon tree is gonna be taken down. Glorfindel is diving in and a couple of those Pikemen are already out of the game. Okay, on the other side, we see some harassment attempts actually from those Lancers, but that's something C Knight has to be doing as well. He has to. He has to take down those Malon trees at the bottom left side. Look at this, they are unprotected. There is no defense, this one is almost level 2. The starting Malon trees are all about to hit level 3 because they are untouched all game long. He has so many level 2 Malon trees now. Because C Knight is defending almost exclusively in the game number 2. Maybe he's trying to rely on the mistakes of his opponent. Because that's also a playstyle we see more and more often. In which one player decides to defend. And then after defending and actually taking down the majority of the enemy army. He's you know, deciding to go for a counter attack. But uh, DJ is making sure to not take those bad fights. And he was actually forcing his opponent to use Warchan defensively. And he was holding his own buff. That's gonna give him the buff advantage. This is an area you should not be fighting at. The Vork Riders, they need to be very careful. There is a statue in the back, but the Elven army, they don't have to buff just yet. And smart move, he's holding on Rallying Call. Just holding. And, uh, you know, the effect from Vorchen is going to be gone soon. And for the next attack, Elven player will have missed and even the buff ready. He has 910 command points collected, boys. That's incredible. The Vestation has been finally unlocked and used. Is he going for Saruman, guys? Oh, the white wizard. No, he's not going. He's going for both the heroes, Sharko and Lords, I think, at the same time. I would go for Saruman at this point. Why not, you know? Because imagine you get a Saruman wizard blast there. Oh, that would be so fiesta. And he had almost the money as well, too. Like, he was 200 resources away from that. Hey, Einhin B94, thank you so much for the Prime, man. Appreciate that. Really means a lot to me. Thank you so much. 
Okay, guys, Isengard has a lot of units on the field. Let's see how much damage he's gonna be able to deal. I mean, this upgrade is doing a great job, giving him a lot of vision control. So he even sees the Malon tree here. He even sees the Builder here. He sees pretty much half the map. With only the upgrade for the cave pads on the fortress. And indeed, we have Sharku, the legendary war hero and lord at the same time, coming from the fort out of the fortress and ready to fight for Isengard for the White Hand. The Builder from DJ has been taken down. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have also a level 2 barracks. We already know what it means. We're gonna get those sexy Mirkwood archers on the field. Elven player has already one of these. A lot of archers. We need to keep an eye on this Sharku. This Sharku can be a nightmare for DJ after this massive fight. Warchan is still on cooldown. We have from the Elven player Rallying Hole and the Mist ready. And on top of that, he even collected 10 power points. Ooh, imagine Sharku right there, right there. Oh my goodness, that would be so amazing. I mean, he needs to man up now. Just fight. Uh, Tawa is a great choice in this situation because the army from elves, they are not made and only the pikemen and Glorfindel can actually damage that. Glorfindel is gonna get almost level 3 after killing one furnace. Okay, Isengard is trying to commit to that fight, but look, the power points are rising from DJ. The, Malon, uh, the Lumber Mill at the top right side will be taken down. Lourdes should be shooting this unit all the time. Where is Lourdes actually? I can't see him. He here he is. Elven player doesn't want to take the fight quite yet. I think he's trying to save for the Eagles. And he's very close to that. I don't know what Lourdes is doing. Lourdes is inting. Lourdes is inting and running it down. The build is inting as well. What is this builder doing? I die with Lourdes, he's saying, or something. But Glorfindel is doing the same thing. But oh my godness. Glorfindel is like, dear Sharku, you might be a strong hero with your splash damage and other shenanigans. But my name is Glorfindel. I am the mightiest elven hero existing. And I do the same thing. What you are doing. But I do it even better. And wiping out the entire Isengard army after the int. Intentionally feeding that was by the way, from C Knight. I don't know. I think he forgot about him. And running it down. The builder was following and the eagles are coming. That should be more than enough to commit to the fortress now. With the help of the pikemen and Glorfindel. The fortress from Isengard should be taken down. He was even going for the upgrade on the fortress for cheaper upgrades. But uh, he has no more money. Full command points for elves. Against only 550 from Isengard. He has no money left anymore. The fortress is going down. And the game number 2 will also be won by DJ Premier, the player from United Kingdom, boys. What a great performance in those two games. As he's only one win away from moving to the next round in which he will be facing against Imperialist. Or C Knight now has to manage to win three games in a row. Which is much easier said than done. All right, GG is being called, um, and we're gonna jump right into the game number three, boys. The game number three between DJ Premier against C Knight is all about to begin this time on the classic map, Fault of Eisenbahn. DJP is leading the series 2-0 against the American player, but nothing has been decided just yet, and everything is possible in Rise of the Witch King. And we might see a great comeback from the American player by winning three games in a row as he has to. Because that's the last chance. Last chance. If he loses that one, he will be out of the tournament. There is no more life. This is already the loser bracket. And if you lose that now, you will be out of the tournament. We're gonna have the Blue Isengard player C Knights building two furnaces. Against the purple model player DJP building two slaughterhouses on the map Hordes of Eisen. Mordor can go for the Eye of Sauron or also Warchant. And C Knight is actually gonna pick the Kribeen already. Which is actually a great pick if you start with the... Uh, he's gonna go for the clan setting. I think it's a great pick regardless because Kribeen is not only gonna debuff the enemy units but also nullify the enemy leadership. And since in most situations Mordor players are picking Eye of Sauron, it's a great counter to that. Alright. Okay, we will have two ferns into the clan sitting into the third ferns. On the other side, I see two slaughterhouses orc pit into the third one. And we have seen Mordor players making Urukai, I mean black orcs actually against uh, against Isengard. And I feel like that's a great. Uh, I mean, I was 
surprised about the effect and about the impact of those black orcs. They are very strong. They are almost as powerful as Urukai. They will definitely win those 1v1 fights against Whitemen of Dunland. They are also not that expensive, they cost only 250 each. So if you have multiple orc pets and you kinda mix in some of those black orcs in between the normal orcs, I think that can be very effective. Two orc pets into the Haradrim Palace from DG Premium. And we will have after the third furnace and the clan seeding uh, Uruk pits coming up for Isengard's player, um, C Knight. Mordo still didn't pick anything just yet. He might still go for the for the Warchan or Tainted Land or Iosauron, obviously. And Isengard uh, went for the Kribane. Okay, in a 1v1 situation, the Wildman they should be able to win this fight. But Wildman, they are more expensive, they cost like almost double the price, they cost also much more command points, 18 more command points actually. Orcs in the current meta are very strong because of the buffs uh, to their command points and also to their damage. They deal now 25% increased damage, which is not shabby at all. But this fight was not even close actually, those Wildmen were dominating this fight in a 1v1 situation, interesting. I was expecting the fight to be a little bit closer. But that's not being the case. And uh, I think against spammy factions like Goblins and also against Mordor with the Orc Pits, class setting might be the way to go for Isengard. Because they are so cost efficient in compared to Urukai. And in compared to Pikeman, for example, right? And they have the pillage as well, so your opponent has to be very careful. He needs to pay attention all the time. If he doesn't, you're gonna steal a lot of money and then take down the slaughterhouse anyway. Especially when you purchase the torches, the damage output is insane with those white men of Dunland. If you have three battalions of them, I think you can one-shot a level to Aradrim Palace. And by the way, we're gonna have Lancers on the field soon, and uh, DJ is playing now a bit more defensively as he should, and placing those orcs right in front of the slaughterhouses to body block those white men of Dunland units. Hey Traffic, welcome! Okay, so nice trample here with those Haradrim Lancers, pretty nice. Um, no damage dealt to the Mordor's economy just yet. There is even another slaughterhouse here in the middle of the map, at the river. They have also pikemen now and he needs more of them, because he has to fight and face against the Lancers now. And it looks like the Mordor player DG Premier is pre preparing himself for a big attack. By the way, he still didn't pick anything from the spellbook, by the way, guys, that's crazy. No Warchan, no Tainted Land, and no Eye of Sauron just yet. Okay, that's gonna be the first creep for Isengard. And I'm lying, that's the second creep for Isengard, as he was already able to creep this one at the right side of the river. Oh, he was able to steal the money, but he's running it down afterwards. DG Premier will be barely able to get away, and Mordor is a faction. You can purchase a Banakiri upgrade from a level 1 Orc Pit. And I feel like, I don't know why they are not doing it. Because if you think about it, every unit pretty much from Mordor is getting benefits from it. First of all, you're gonna have the self-regeneration with level 2. Second thing is, you're gonna have the damage boost from Oryx and Black Oryx, with the Bloodthirsty. And then you have Haradrim Arches, for example, with the Barbed Arrow Shot. You know, every unit is getting benefits, and the Benakiri upgrade also kinda got reduced now, depending on the tier of the units, by the way, that's one of the changes in the 8.4. So depends on your unit, as you can see, for example, the Corsars, they have to pay 80 for the banner carrier upgrade, and the orcs, they only have to pay 50. So for each orc for 50, you get 25% increased damage. For 50! I mean, that's really not a lot of money, come on, guys. And the upgrade itself costs only 400, so I'm surprised that we don't see that often. I feel like if you have multiple orcs with the, with the bloodthirsty and then horse bonus as well, this damage all stacks up and then you can actually become a monster orc, you know what I'm saying? Like a like an orc 2.0 kind of thing. Okay, we're gonna see a fight here between Wildman against uh, Easterlings. One thing what I was always wondering about is the fact that you can also steal money from creeps with the pillage. Like, that's crazy. But the money? Who's the pirates here? Let's see. Oh, DJ is like, let me grab the trash. Okay, they are sharing like brothers in arms. The attack continues here. The Corsars are actually dealing a lot, a lot of damage from a safe distance with the bombs. Um, we have this slaughterhouse. It's gonna be definitely taken down. Um, no troll cage this time from Mordor, by the way. 
Oh, he's committing to the Orc Uruk pit and actually bursting it down. That's quite nice. And yeah, the Corsars, also units, by the way, we are not getting to see that very often. But I feel like they are also reliable units. They are kind of semi-range, semi like extra overs kind of thing. And the fire bombs is very effective against structures as well. Now Isengard's being in a really, really rough situation right now. DJ Premier has collected 450 command points, has 4 power points after I and Warchant, which is a double buff action. On the other side, we have 4 power points collected for Isengard. He just lost one of his main production buildings to Uruk Pit, which already got replaced now. Um, he might even lose the clan setting, but I think that's not gonna be the case because he has now extra overs on the field that should be able to defend that and keep it alive. And he keeps losing those furnaces all the time as well. Gothmog is joining the battlefields now for the support of the orcs. Orc pits are, one of them is getting upgraded actually to level 2, which means we're gonna definitely get to see some of these black orcs now. On the other side, um, Isengard's player is kinda... I mean, he has still 600 command points collected, so it's not like he's very poor or something. But again, in order to be able to keep the spam of the Urukai and Pikemen, you will need much more command points than your opening needs with the Moro faction. Because Orcs, you can even spam them now on low, low command points, because they are very cheap, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of uh, command points. So, you know, when you are only sitting on 400 command points, you will have much more units on the field than your opponent does for the same price of investment, if this makes sense. And for Urukai, they cost five times the amount of an orc. And for that, I, I don't think like they are as strong as five orcs and as effective as five orcs. You might even have the horde bonus now, but they will definitely have the leadership, which can get negated once again from the Kribin. The Gothmog can... I mean, Gothmog's day of the Orc leadership can get absolutely shut down in this situation. He's gonna go for the War Chant, has now double buff action. He needs to use Kreebane if he wants to deal with the army. He has to. And he will do. He will do it now. Isengard's buff is on cooldown still, even though he's debuffing the enemy units, but the War Chant is not getting negated, obviously. Uh, Gothmog is leveling up to level 2, using the uh, Fury now. Uh, Isengard needs the Vestation as soon as possible. And by the way, he also stopped making Lancers. He only made this one Lancer. He actually purchased the Venakeri upgrade. That's what I like to see. And I'm actually curious now if he's gonna buy the Venakeri upgrade on the Black Oryx. I would love to see that. On the Black Oryx, it costs a double, by the way. As you can see on the Oryx, it would only cost 50. On the Black Oryx, the upgrade costs 100. So because Black Oryx are obviously much, much stronger and the 25% damage, because they are much tankier, the 25% damage on top of their damage is more important is more Im impactful because 25 is gonna is kind of it's gonna matter right i mean for example if your base damage is 100 25 is gonna give you 25 more damage but as when your base damage is like 10 and 25 is gonna be only 2.5 you know quick math by the way I, as i'm saying that's an educational stream here guys teaching me everything math physics rise of the witch king <laughs> all right so we have a huge army from Isengard. He might actually come back to this game. Let's see. Is it best of 5? Yes, it's best of 5. How much normal orc cost? They cost only 80. Black orcs, they cost 250. Okay, we have a fight in the middle. There are a lot of extra overs in the backside. But also the model player has a bunch of... He's gonna go for the Wildman of Dunland on top of the archers. Okay, that might be effective though. Um, I guess. But they are not buffed or anything. They don't have war chant. Gothmog is taking care of these, and Wildmen are demolishing the Archer army. Okay. After all, the Wildman of Dunland was actually doing a great work. And Mordor has nothing left on the field anymore. What a turn. He has 775 command points, but the problem is he is very low on the command points he is using right now. And Isengard can now deal a lot of damage to Mordor's economy. He was also able to creep the troll layer at the top right side. The builder from DJ is gonna be taken down here. And he is still attacking. The attack isn't over just yet. The slaughterhouse here with the industry buff has to get protected. And now the lances are coming. And there are no pikemen. They are diving in. You're gonna take some damage now in return from the extroverse. Oh, they need to be avoiding those pikemen. 
Oh, he's gonna get slowed down, and when you get slowed down like this, you won't be able to trample. Your trample is not gonna deal any damage. And the entire battalion has been almost taken down. But luckily, he has purchased the banner carry upgrade. And they're gonna hit level 2 now. We have a troll cage on, uh, on the field, and I think it's gonna look like... It looks like that he will be able to take down the troll cage before any troll is gonna make it on the field. And now Moto player is kind of falling apart. Luckily though, he was able to keep this level 3 slaughterhouse with the industry alive, which is very important. Gothmog is level 5 now for the fear resistant. It doesn't matter against Isengard. Isengard doesn't have fear. Uh, and the fear resistant against, you know, against a faction like Isengard is not going to be very impactful and very important. I think Gothmog's main reason to get him on the field is like because of the leadership, because of the carnage or fury it's called, but it's the same effect as carnage. 200% uh, damage and 25% armor. It's the same exact same stats like you get from the Carnage of Lourdes. 6 power points collected, 525. Mordor has a great eco. He might go for a Velbis, even though I would say Velbis in the current situation is not going to be very effective. Why? Because Velbis' weakness are extrovers and C Knight has a lot of them. And he keeps spamming extrovers all the time. Extrovers are dealing a lot of damage to Velbis. I mean, I'm not saying that like a Felbis would be useless, because Felbis has still the secret and everything for the fear, but he's not gonna be very impactful either. That's the problem. Okay, Mordu is now sitting only on 475 command points. Is almost command points kept. Lost the troll cage. Lost the slaughterhouse in the backside. Um, he has zero trolls on the field, by the way, and there is a tower protecting this furnace and also this pathway, kinda. The Haradrim Lancers were able to take down those units. Isengard is preparing himself for another big attack. He has zero heroes on the field, by the way. And Kribian is not gonna be available for the next fight. That means the leadership from Gothmog can't get negated. Gothmog is here level 5. Um, he stopped making Black Orcs, by the way. He has only one of these. Um, I think he's... I mean, he has still money. The problem is not his money. I think the problem is the fact that he can't keep those slaughterhouses alive. And you have that much money, maybe try to get uh, Mouth of Sauron on the field. Mouth of Sauron is one of the one of the very important and impactful heroes from Mordor faction with the Daub's ability, with the mobility part. You can use him for harassment. I will be used. I doesn't add anything to the orcs right now, but it gives leadership to the Corsars and to the yeah, to the Corsars only. The Orc Pit, one, one of them is gonna be taken down. The slaughterhouse level 3 is destroyed as well. Tainted's line will be used from Mordor player. For defense. Gothmog is doing a great job, a great job and the orc, black orcs are also doing a great job. The orc pets level 2 will be still taken down. Okay. But there are just too many extrovers on the field. Haradrim palace level 3 though and we are getting some of those Haradrim arches on the field. But they don't have buff at this point and he needs to move the eye of Sauron to them. To give them leadership at least. During all this time we have some harassment going at the bottom, bottom right side. Barricade will be chosen from the Moto player. Will be most likely gonna be used for defense pur for defensive purposes. Maybe not here. At this point, he needs to make sure to keep the Haradrim Palace level 3 alive. And the pikemen are taking down another slaughterhouse here from DJ Premier. He needs to be careful with the builder. And he's getting the troll cage to level 2. So the plan from DJ is simple. He wanna make those Haradrim archers and he wanna actually buff them or give them leadership with the drama trolls. 450 command points for Mordor only, and we have 875 with Field of Fires. And that's gonna be now hallelujah moment for Isengard. That's the milestone Isengard has to reach to be rich. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you have Devastation, and he doesn't even have Devastation, he can still go for that with 10 power points collected. But when you have Devastation and Field of Fires, and then you have like over 600 something command points, I think you will never run out of money with Isengard. You are gonna be the richest faction in the game. And you will be able to keep spamming units all the time. And that's why he has so many units on the field. Like he has full, full command points almost. Mordor is sitting only on 500 command points. But still, industry is gonna be available soon again. We have Mouth of Sauron on the field indeed. I don't know, but he's gonna run it down kind of from DJ. He needs to be very careful. He's, he's trying to get into the backline, but that's not Sharku. That's Mouth of Sauron only. And he's forced to retreat. The barricade is doing absolutely nothing here, by the way. Not being even able to shoot down those extrovers. 
Govmok is level 7 now. It doesn't matter too much when he's level 10, because it's gonna only increase his health and damage. But he's not gonna get any new abilities from, uh, from his kit to use. Another builder from DJ has been taken down. Uh, Mordor has industry almost back up. Are we getting drama trolls on the field though? I mean, he went for the troll cage upgrade to level 2, but he didn't make any drama trolls just yet. I mean, for his defense, he is low on money. And he also needs to keep, uh, keep spamming those Haradrim Arches all the time. Orc Pit is getting upgraded to level 2. I think he wanna make Black Orcs and, you know, uh, Haradrim Arches, the elite units of the Moro faction. The last remaining Slaughterhouse level 3 has been taken down. And he might even lose more than that. Did he use the Wildman of Dunland summon here actually? Yes, he did. And they are, as we know, dealing a lot of damage to the enemy's structures as well. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of damage here. Definitely a lot of damage. And look the map. The map is turning absolutely blue, boys. And those Haradrim arches are not moving from DJ. And yes, the lenses are coming, but will this be enough? It might be actually enough to defend this troll cage. It's level 2 after all, has 4500 health. Not easy to take down. And the Moro player will be able to protect himself for now. Isengard has to be careful because Mordor has now very strong units on the field. Even though Gothmog doesn't give leadership to the Haradrim Arches, but the Tainted Land gives them buff. And Mordor is one of the factions that can win the game when he's behind all the time, all the game, by just stalling long enough for the power points, for the units, you need to dominate those fights. But C9 is building four towers here, boys. Four towers to block an entire pathway at the bottom left side. Mouth of Sauron has to be very careful. Level 4 is gonna be needed, but he might die here to the Extrovers. That was very close. Very close. You have two Uruk Pits, a level 2 uh, clan setting, and a level 2 uh, work Pit. He's going for the upgrades now, purchasing the upgrade on the Fortress first for the cheaper upgrades. That's gonna reduce the amount of um, resources you need to invest to get the upgrades purchased on your units. Um, only Gothmog and uh, Mouth of Sauron, zero heroes on the field so far from Isengard. He's just heavily relying on his units, which might be a mistake. Because we don't, we never should underestimate the impact of a hero in the late game. Especially from a strong hero like Mouth of Sauron. Even though I can't see him on the field anymore. Did he even die? Ah, uh, he's here. Level 4 is gonna be very impactful by the way. The doubt ability is an active debuff. You make the enemy units much, much weaker, but he's playing with fire at this point. I mean, at this point, you need to just go back and let him heal up. He's like literally sitting there with zero person health. Radram archers, oh, they are left alone, and it looks like they're gonna be taken down here, unfortunately, by those extroverts. Or leave one wolf alive, but the sheep are never safe. Oh, he's gonna come in for the for the arrow volley from the spell book. Mordor has now arrow volley. Industry and Barricade. Isengard has 19, almost 20 power points collected. And he's only 5 power points away from the big guy. And the big guy can actually end the game here by himself. And take down any production building, any resource building, which are left from the model player DJ Premier. The first hero, and his name is Sharko from Isengard. Armory is getting upgraded to level 3 for the heavy armor, forge plates, pyro upgrade and the banner carry upgrade. Isengard can afford that. He's getting a lot of money per second. With the lumber mills glowing like fire and increasing the resource income by 70%. That's incredible. And the fact that he has so much map control and sitting on full command points as well. Has multiple level 3 furnaces now. Has an incredible amount of resource income. And if this is not enough, you can always go for devastation and for industry as well. Um, we have the first drama troll on the field actually now. The siege works level 1. I mean, Mordor player needs a lot of stuff now. The problem is, he's gonna either run out of money or out of command points. That's the problem he has. So, when you are running out of command points, what you need to do is make sure to have the units you need and that you can also win those fights even if you are low on command points. In compared to your opponent's army. Those units are definitely Haradrim archers. Black Orcs, Patapults, maybe Drama Trolls for the leadership part. 
and you need to sp stop making more and more normal orcs. But now Isengard has also heavy armor purchased on those extrovers that looks actually pretty nice, I gotta say, on the HD edition. Okay, 21 power points collected by C Knight. He's diving in, boys. Let's see how much damage he will be able to deal. We have full command points and 22 power points collected now. And the Isengard army with upgrades is very hard to deal with. Nice trample here. Road ability was on cooldown, couldn't be used on those uh, for those work riders. The builder from DJ might be also in trouble. The barricade is doing absolutely nothing in this situation. And Isengard is trying to get it 25. He's very close to that. Less than half a power point needed. Buffmok is level 8, but he can't win the game alone. Mouth of Sauron was finally level 4 for the Doubt ability, but there is no follow up. And the Summon Dragon, which in my opinion is the best summon when it comes to take down the enemy structures, is being summoned, ladies and gentlemen. And look at the damage now. Booyah, that's a level 3 Siege Works, by the way. He was trying to get the Black Riders on the field, and it's getting literally 2 shotted. Not 3 shotted, actually. Look, look how much life it has. <laughs> 6,000 health, 3 shotted. Okay, he might also be able to take down the troll cage, but the, the damage he's dealing in an area might be able to hit multiple structures. If he, for example, attacks his tower, he will definitely end up killing the orc pit and the slaughterhouse at the same time. Taking down the level 3 Haradrim palace first. He has 3,000 almost resources collected. And DJ is gonna call it GG, boys. That was the first victory Potentially the beginning of an end, possibly for DJ Premier. Let's see if C Knight can actually win two more games in a row for a great comeback. The game number four is all about to begin, boys. Goblins against Isengard this time on the map Sakura Forest 2. The score is 2 1 for DJ Premier, and he's only one win away from entering the loser bracket round four. And C Knight has to deny that. He needs to now win two games in a row. This time against the goblins as Isengard. Let's get it started. Cracking a cold one like a boss. With the boss. With the bros. Through that. Through that. I read that in every possible way. In, you know, wrong in every possible way. Alright, we have the purple goblin player DJP against the blue Isengard player C Knight. Who's building two furnaces. I'm assuming he can go for the clan setting actually. I think clan setting is a great choice against the goblins. On the other side I see two tunnels. Pot potentially into the spider pit. But no, that's not going to be that's not gonna be the case. It's going to be a goblin cave. So last time when they played goblins against Isengard. I think it was on the map. Um, Etan Morris. If I'm not mistaken. The goblin player was making four goblin caves against the Isengard's player. Mm, no white slayers to creep. Okay, he's gonna go for the clan setting this time. Two ferns into the clan setting. And we would have the third tunnel coming up around the own fortress. So normally, you have a different choice as well. You can move with the builder immediately forward to build the third tunnel more offensively. But I think that's the more safe way. And safe is the way to go in a deciding match. If you rather leave the tournament and get kind of kicked out or if you continue with a potential chance of winning the big cash prize of $320 as the winner of the tournament. The second Goblin Cave is coming up now for DJ Premier and we see a Uruk Pits now. Um, what do you guys think chat? Let me know. What do you guys think about a second clan setting just to keep spamming Weidman of Dunland all the time? I mean, maybe Uruk Pit is also not bad, because from the Uruk Pit you can make potentially some crossbowmen to defend yourself. But maybe clan setting spam is the way to go. Because you can keep spamming Wildman of Tanlen, they are very cost efficient. The build time is also incredibly fast. You can see how fast they are coming out of the clan setting now. They are going for the creep, but the Goblin Warriors are here now. In a 1v1 situation, normally the Wildman are able to win that fight. But in this case, they are already badly damaged from the work. So he might just wait, he know now what Isengard is planning to do. And he might try to interrupt the creep and steal the creep potentially and also even the treasure. Um, three goblin caves now already for goblin player DJ Premier. And on the other side, 
Yeah, getting more Wildsman, and I, yeah, that's what I meant before. He's gonna go for the crossbow man, and I think that's a great plan. If you have like two crossbow men, you should be good to go for now. And you should be actually ready to defend at least against three, four goblin warriors when they are even war chanted with the buff. Okay, Isengard's player was not able to creep the Swark layer. He's looking for potential tunnels. Uh, the goblin warriors are here. Two of them were able to survive. Now he's gonna recommit on the on the creep. During all this time, goblin player is taking the creep at the left side of the river. And we might have a small skirmish fight here between wildmen and goblins, but that's a 2v1 situation. They are also using the Keef Bats. No! It's not Keef Bats, it's actually Kribin. And I don't know about this usage. Oh, that's a bad usage of Kribin in my opinion. It was a 1v2 1v situation. And it was kind of wasted now. That's gonna give the Goblin player now a big advantage of the War Chant. Even though DG Premier didn't pick anything just yet. I mean, interesting to notice is the fact that Isengard's player C9 is always starting with Kribin against Goblins. Um, maybe uh, I was always thinking the reason for that is the work pit starts, but in this case he's not even starting with the work pit, he was actually going for the clan setting and Uruk pit. Maybe the buff is the better way to go. Because in this this case he was just wasting them. And they're gonna be on cooldown now for a while and that's gonna give DJ Premier the chance to go for a massive attack. Look how many goblin warriors he has already on the field. There is only one crossbowman and he's actually building up the second clan setting now. And I don't know if he's ready to defend this. He has no buff and no debuff against buffed goblins. Big Warchan is incoming. There we go, boys. Ooh, that's gonna be hitting like an absolute truck. I don't see him defending this one with only one crossbow, man. He needs to retreat now. He needs to retreat and deal with that. There are so many goblins now on the field. What can you do against such a reckless hit? Yes, he's going for a counter-attack, and I don't know about that. I can't tell you if this is gonna work or not. We have Spiderlings also joining the battlefield now. He better deals massive amount of damage, because this is gonna be Fiesta. The class setting has been taken down. The Furnace is getting bursted down. And he has only one Crossbowman and one Wildman of Dunlan. That's not gonna be enough. And the Furnace in the backside is also gonna get bursted down for sure. During all this time, he will be at least able to take down one of these tunnels. Uh, he has also Goblin Archers now on the field, getting the second one out. And the problem is now, he's forced to deal with three Goblin Caves. So even though at the beginning of the attack from C Knight, there were no Goblins around, but that's gonna change in one second. From three production buildings, even four with the Spider Pit, he's gonna get so many units on the field within seconds. Um, which should give Goblin player more than enough power to defend such an attack. And one tunnel against two furnaces and a clan setting. I think that's a trade Isengard's player should not be taking. Maybe the way to go was definitely to retreat after seeing the big army, but again, offense is in the most cases, you know, the best defense. But that was none of these cases, boys. That was none of these cases. Okay, on the other side, we see more and more Wildman. He actually went again for the for the second clan setting. And I don't see any tunnels close to the right side. So the tunnel he has is at the river at the top side. There is another one at the bottom left side. And normally, the goblin players are trying to build those tunnels more offensively. But uh, DG Premier is playing definitely very careful and very safe. He has also a great amount of vision control. Talking about vision control, I think a cave bats upgrade on the fortress from Isengard might be a great solution against the goblins. Just to have the vision you need to see the enemy units coming when they are around this area, it's gonna increase your vision control and it's gonna also increase your reaction time. The Kribin is gonna be used now defensively. And Sea Knight has collected also War Chants, which is gonna be used offensively this time. Cave pads are ready, which will be used defensively from goblins. Warchan is still on cooldown. But the spider links are coming from the backside and actually flanking quite nicely those crossbow men. Crossbow men are a great counter to the, to the spider links in normal cases, but in this case, it's 1 versus 4, and there is no chance of Isengard dealing the damage he's looking for. Did he even purchase the torches? Nope, he didn't. 
This tunnel is even rebuilding over time and Isengard once again was only able to kill some goblins, but he was not able to deal any kind of damage to the structures of the goblin player DJ Premier. DJ now has two um, class settings on the field and a crossbowman, I mean, and a Uruk pit. <laughs> okay, he might be able to take down this tunnel here, but goblin player has so many goblins here, he can just enter the tunnel and, you know, come out from this one. Try to defend. But if he doesn't demolish it in time, as we can see, this plus one, plus one all the time is gonna give Isengard more and more money to work with. And this game is not decided just yet, but it looks good once again for DJ Premier. He's gonna use Warchan on those spiderlings and look at the damage, boys. That's crazy, they are bursting it down within a second. 650 command points for goblins. On the other side, we have 425 command points only for C Knight. He has 6 power points collected after Warchant and Krivain. We have almost 7 power points collected for DJP after the cave beds and Warchant. So, as we know, the spider, I mean, the goblin player DJ Premier can always go for the spider summon with 10 power points. And in this situation, I would recommend C Knight going for the Devastation because he's very low on resources and he will need the money from Devastation really badly in this game number 4. Three Goblin Caves, a Spider Pits level 1 and a Fissure level 1. He might go for the Cave Trolls potentially, but I think he's gonna stick up with the half Troll Swordman. They are way, way tankier than normal Goblins and... They might be able to tank the damage from the crossbowmen and extroverts quite a lot. And in a 1v1 situation, they're gonna dominate against the Wildman of Dunland big time. Okay. Uh, Isengard is now being able to kind of push him back, but it's gonna be hard now to defend against the attack from the Half-Troll Swordsman. He was also able to see the tunnel now at the bottom left side, but he was not able to see those Half-Troll Swordsmen until now. In fairness, he's gonna get bursted down. And there is not much to defend from C Knight. Yes, actually only Wildman, and again, Wildman, they don't stand a chance against the Half-Troll Swordsman. He's gonna be able to creep the White Slayer at the left side. Uh, we have a lot of Wildman on the fields now from double clan setting. They might also be able to take down this tunnel here. But you can see yourself, the fights are quite one-sided at this point between Half-Trolls and a Wildman units. And he will definitely need the spot of the crossbowman as soon as possible. Otherwise, the clan setting might be taken down once again. And they are leveling up quite fast. With level 2, they unlock the charge attack. This tunnel, I mean, on the other side, he's also being able to deal some damage, you know. The thing is, he has now, he's gonna go for the Wildman of Dunland? Really? Or he's gonna use it on top of the Goblin Archers with the Warchant combined? He's gonna try to deal now as much damage as possible. But I feel like Devastation would be the safer way, because now he needs to... Now he will end up losing many, many of these furnaces to the Spider Ally Summon. The, the After all, Swordsmen are still alive. He's gonna also use the Kribian defensively now. And he needs to deal now as much damage as possible, but that's much, much easier said than done. There are just too many units he needs to, he needs to deal with first. And the Wildmen are dying like flies. He was finally, I mean, luckily able to keep the clan sitting here alive. But he lost two furnaces already. This one here, this one here in the front side. And the one in the back side is also gonna be taken down. There is only one furnace left from C Knight, which is level 2. All the other furnaces are level 1, that's why he's only sitting on 475. It's gonna be 425 now after losing this furnace in the back side. They shouldn't be able to deal much more damage than that. Because I think they were not able to see this furnace here at the bottom right. Now Isengard is going for a counter-attack, but his attack was not even that successful. He was only able to destroy one of these tunnels, but wasn't even able to finish the rubble. And the goblin player has just too many units on the field. Look at this unit. And the unit amount of command points he has right now under his control are rising every single second. He has 725 command points without any burrow expansions around the fortress. The tunnel here will even be protected for now. The half troll swordsmen are coming, goblin warriors are coming just in time. There is no escape in this situation because goblin warriors are faster than crossbowmen. In this, when, when you are finding yourself in a situation like this, just stand there and fight. There is absolutely no reason why you should run. I mean, the only reason actually you should ever run is when there is a backup. When you have, a, you know, reinforcements coming, you want to kind of bait them into them, but you don't want to run away from the goblin warriors. 
Okay? And those crossbowmen, they don't have any protection. That's why they are actually getting sniped down all the time. The furnace here is gonna get bursted down with the warchan, definitely. And those spiders, spider allies, they are doing a great job. And we need to give credits to the goblin playstyle from DJ Premier because he's able to keep himself alive, defending himself all the time, while being able to deal massive amount of damage on the other side of the map, which is quite impressive. And now he has also multiple tunnels, and he, he manages to keep Isengard for the majority of the time at the right side, at Isengard's side. This way he's gonna be untouched himself. I mean, he has, after all, five production buildings now. All of them are level one. He keeps spamming goblins, half throw swordsmen, and spiderlings all the time, making a great use of every single unit he has on the field, grouping all the time with more and more units. He has a Uruk Pits level two, actually. <clears throat> And Berserkers, man, I don't know what, what I should think about these units, because they think I, for that, you know, for, to have an opinion about the Berserkers, I barely saw them so far. Like, most of the time, we never see Uruk Pit getting upgraded to level 2, and if we do, it's not because of level 2, it's because of level 3 for the Uruk Deathbringers. But, I don't know, man, from like a thousand games, what I was seeing from Isengard so far, I've seen Berserkers maybe twice. 825 command points for goblins against 350 only and this attack is gonna be nearly impossible to defend now for C Knight and DJ Premier performing really nicely and remember the winner of this series is gonna face in the next round against Sauron Sauron was in the winner in the winner bracket he lost against Ave Have in the semi-finals of the winner bracket and now he needs to fight in the semi-finals of the loser bracket. This time potentially... Prob probably killed one link. <laughs> this time potentially against uh, DJ Premier. In the semi-finals of the loser bracket within the next following days. Because the, the grand finals of this tournament is going to be played at next Sunday. So tomorrow in exactly one week we're going to finish the tournament. That means all the matches we're going to have... Uh, you know... We have to finish within the next following days. So we are set up for the finals. Alright boys, GG well played and uh, thank you so much for the participation in this World Championship C Night. Great performance overall, DJ Premier was able to win the series 3-1 and now moving to the semi-finals of the loser bracket boys. Pretty nice.